We've done a handful of stories on the band Creed, but I felt it was time to look at the history of the band. Frontman Scott Stapp would grow up in Orlando, Florida. By the age of five, his father left and his stepfather, along with his mother, were strict Pentecostal Christians. So much so that even Christian rock wasn't allowed in their house. The only exception to their strict music rules was Elvis, who his mother was a big fan of. Stapp would tell Sven, I definitely had an Elvis complex when I was a little kid. I thought he was the coolest guy in the whole world. Sometimes Stapp would dream that Elvis would put him on stage during a live show. When Stapp was 11, he would go behind his parents' back and would buy his first record, which would be Def Leppard's Pyromania. His parents would eventually find the record, and as his punishment for acting against their wishes, he would be forced to recite the scripture. By the age of eight, Stapp would tell VH1's Behind the Music that he found his calling as a performer, originally envisioning he would be a singing evangelist. While on the surface, Stapp may have seemed like a guy who was into poetry or a member of high school philosophy club, he was a jock in high school, playing basketball, football, and baseball. His athletic activities would be bounded by religion. He would tell Spen, my whole life was church, adding that he would attend Bible study on Friday night and went to services twice on Sunday and once on Wednesday nights. His community were such strong believers in their faith that he saw some members of his church speaking in tongues. Stapp stood out in school being forced to wear a necktie and adhere to a strict 10 p.m. curfew. Despite a strict upbringing, Stapp didn't feel a strong connection to religion, telling Spen, I would sit in my room and wish I could go to parties after the football game. I wished I could go to the prom. I felt weird. I felt different. Adding about his connection to his parents' faith, I thought something was wrong with me, so I lived with a lot of guilt. I constantly found myself asking God to prove himself to me, which is a cardinal sin. I'd lie in bed and say, God, if you're real, just make my light go off so I won't doubt it. I promise I'll be the best Christian in the world. By the age of 17, Stapp soon left home in the middle of the night having reached his breaking point with his parents and would live with a close friend. His time away from home would be short-lived as within a month, he'd return to his parents. To please his dad, Stapp would enroll in Christian College Lee University in Tennessee, taking a chance on a sports scholarship. But Scott's newfound freedom would put him at odds with his Christian upbringing and the administrators on campus, recalling, I kind of went to the extreme. I just wanted to party. It was very self-destructive. After learning about his behavior, the school confronted Stapp. Believing all his life that honesty resulted in forgiveness, Stapp was upfront about what he had been up to, but it resulted in him getting expelled. Not wanting to return home, he convinced his grandparents to put enough money down for a deposit on a small apartment a short distance away from campus. With no furniture, electricity, or much else, including hope, Stapp would begin writing down his feelings. Unbeknownst to him at the time, feelings would form the basis for songs. The following year in the summer of 1993, Stapp would move back to Orlando, but chose not to live with his parents, opting to keep surviving on his own. It would be in Orlando he would start dating a girl who introduced him to legendary rock acts The Doors and Led Zeppelin. And he witnessed one of his first concerts, Lenny Kravitz with Blind Melon, and he saw Porn Over Pyros. Side note guys, we've done a whole video on the history of Porno for Pyros. The link is down below. It was during this time Stapp wanted to become a musician and was inspired by the Doors frontman Jim Morrison, who at one point lived in Tallahassee. Stapp would follow in his footsteps relocating to the city, thinking he would be able to find other like-minded musicians. It was by strange coincidence that he would cross paths with a guitarist named Mark Tremonti in the city. Tremonti and Stapp went to high school together, but weren't super close back then. A Detroit transplant, Tremonti would start playing guitar at the age of 11 and would tell louder sound that his family wasn't very musical, but it would be 80s movies that got him into the guitar. Recalling, I'd seen Back to the Future with Michael J. Fox, rocking Chuck Berry, which was so cool. In 1986, musical drama Crossroads where Steve Vai and Ralph Macchio go at it in a guitar duel, and it was one of the sickest things I'd ever seen. I asked my parents for a guitar for Christmas. First Christmas goes by, no guitar. Second Christmas, same. Eventually, a guy sold me his black imitation Les Paul for 10 bucks. I took it home, it played like shit, but I just sat there trying to learn how to play it. I didn't take lessons, just started trying to write. Firstly, with just my thumb. It was during his teenage years, Tremonti started a band and recorded a demo. But by the time he turned 15, his father had relocated the family to Orlando. 
Tremonti would tell VH1 that his friends back home in Detroit were into heavy metal listening to the likes of Metallica and Anthrax, while his new friends in Orlando listened strictly to pop music. By the time Stapp and Tremonti reconnected in Tallahassee, both men would work restaurant jobs at Governor Square Mall. Tremonti worked at Chili's while Stapp worked at Barnacle Bills. The pair began writing songs, which came quickly, and by 1995, they assembled a band with bassist Brian Marshall and drummer Scott Phillips. For Stapp, putting his feelings to music became therapeutic. The band's name was originally Naked Toddler, before changing it to something more commercial in Creed. Within six months of forming, Creed scored a recurring gig at a local restaurant named Floyd's, which became a hotbed for some of the biggest rock acts in the country. It would be the restaurant manager, Jeff Hansen, who saw something special in Creed and sold all his businesses so he could take on managing the band. In order to get noticed by labels, Hansen got the band into the studio to record their debut album, My Own Prison. The album was recorded for only $6,000. However, it wasn't a continuous process as the band would only pay the producer when they could cobble together enough money for studio time. The first song the band recorded would be the title track. The song came to stop as a revelation in the middle of the night. He would tell MTV News, one night I woke up about 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. from a dream and I just wrote it all down. I didn't know it was a song at the time. A few days later, I called guitarist Mark Tremonti. He had been putting together some music, and we sat down and got the song together in about 30 minutes. The recording of the album would come to a halt after Stop took all of the money the band had made at this point and invested it into a pyramid scheme. While Stop meant well, he was naive by his own admission. The group would have to turn to their manager to bail them out, and Hansen would get a $3,000 loan from a friend to help them finish the record. Hansen was able to take a demo of the title track to a local DJ named Robbie Robb at WXR 101.1. The DJ would tell VH1's behind the music, the reaction was instantaneous. The phones were ringing before the song was over. People wanted to know who that was, where they could see them. Rather than waiting for record companies to come calling, the band would self-release their first album. By the time Creed released their first record, Florida by the mid-90s had developed a reputation for being the next scene for up-and-coming rock bands. Groups like Matchbox 20, Collective Soul, Seven Mary Three, who we've previously covered on this channel, and link is down below, had previously nabbed major recording contracts, and Creed thought they'd be next. Major label Atlantic Records showed interest in signing the group, but things fell through. Other labels told Creed that the type of music the band played was too much like grunge and was not popular anymore, and that people wanted more groups like Marilyn Manson and Nine Inch Nails. By the spring of 97, it would be an A&R rep named Diana Meltzer, who represented a new indie label based in New York called Wind Up, who saw the band live and pushed her husband's label to sign the group. While Wind Up didn't have any bands on their roster yet, they could offer Creed a lot of attention and priority, and had a major distribution deal through Sony. Creed signed with a label and a couple of the members, including Stop, would sign the recording contract in blood, sealing their fate, or so they thought. The contract would be sent back to the band because signing anything in red is considered void. Their debut record would be remixed and re-released in August of 1997, and Creed would hit the road. But the initial reception was chilly. Since everybody who worked for the band and their label weren't established in the business, not many people gave them attention. The group's manager came up with a plan that the band would repeatedly play two dozen or so markets with strong rock histories. The plan paid off as each time Creed came through town, more fans would show up. Their fans soon started placing calls to radio stations around the country to play Creed. The tour, along with rushing radio stations to play their material, helped propel album sales to 25,000 a week and peak at number 22 on the album charts going six times platinum in America. Soon enough, Creed set a record for any debut album, having four number one singles. In the title track, Torn, What's This Life For, and One. Despite the success, some critics didn't like Creed, writing them off as a poor man's Pearl Jam. Staff would respond to these comparisons, telling MTV, it could be worse, they could be comparing us to some shitty band that no one has ever heard of, rather than the biggest band of the decade. Spin Magazine would write about the band's detractors, saying some of the phrases critics have used to describe Creed's music. White bread, bloated, and monotonous, bland and bombastic, aimless, formless, charmless bluster Pearl Jam knockoffs. Creed also never seemed to get much love from fellow musicians, with Clown of Slipknot telling a Canadian newspaper, 
If I gotta listen to bands like Creed anymore, I might as well shoot myself, dude. The band also feuded with Limp Bizkit, and according to MTV, Blink-182 would poke fun at Creed during their live shows. Not just that, but Dexter Holland of The Offspring, according to the LA Times, used to wear a shirt during live shows that read, Even Jesus Hates Creed. One of the strangest things about Creed, much like Collective Soul, is that people identified more with their music than their image, as both bands initially got big because of rock radio, not MTV. Creed did several things that helped them become successful, bypassing the traditional routes most bands take. Creed toured extensively, built a loyal fan base in middle America, their label was internet savvy, and they built a following on rock radio. Staff would tell MTV, we hadn't gotten a lot of press over TV, you know. It was strictly radio. There was nothing visual behind it. It kind of made me feel like we were the people's choice. You know, we went straight to them and they bought our records and that's what makes it so special. This was a sentiment echoed by the LA Times who profiled the band with Stop telling the publication, we've sold millions of records and nobody knows what we look like. The Orlando Sentinel would interview one record store owner who told the publication, We've done really well with their new album, but I couldn't name a guy in the band, but more power to them if they make it work. Apart from critics writing them off, the media also took note of the group's emphasis on religion and clean cut image. Rolling Stone would dub the music Creed played as, and I quote, every guy rock, with Tremonti agreeing, telling the publication, that's pretty true. Compared to all the other bands out there, when we're walking down the street, we look just like anybody else. We're your average next door neighbor kind of people. In a separate interview, Tremonti would tell Spin, I think there are a lot of kids in strict families who are allowed to listen to us because we don't have any negative messages in our music. That's not to say the band didn't question things. As Stapp would tell Billboard in 1997, I want to live the opposite way from how I grew up. I wanted to question things rather than accept them on faith. We're so young and we haven't found what we're looking for. While the press labeled them as a Christian band, the band's own website back in the day would write, according to the Washington Post, we are not a Christian band. A Christian band has an agenda to lead others to believe in their specific religious beliefs. We have no agenda. The whole foundation of being a Christian is a personal relationship. I can say that all the members believe in God, but we each differ on our methods to reach him. It was during the touring cycle for the group's first album that Stapp would meet his first wife, Hilary Burns, while celebrating his 23rd birthday. They would have a son together, and he provided the inspiration for Stapp to write the band's biggest hit of their career, With Arms Wide Open, which was found on the group's second album. The band's sophomore effort, 1999's Human Clay, would be written while the band was on the road for their first record, at sound checks or on their tour bus. The band would utilize the internet to run a campaign for the record, including giving away a free download of the single Higher through Amazon.com, Tower Records, and The Warehouse, and coalition of independent music stores. Radio stations would also give away the single on their websites, with the market with the most downloads getting a free Creed concert. Stapp would talk about the importance of the internet in marketing the band's music in 1999, telling Billboard, the internet is such a cool medium. It's definitely the future of how bands will know what their fans are thinking. Human Clay would top the Billboard charts, beating out Garth Brooks' album In the Life of Chris Gaines. Side note, we've done a whole video on Chris Gaines and it's one of our most popular videos. The link is down below. Human Clay would go on to sell over 10 million copies just in America. What's amazing is that just a few short years between 1997 and 1999, Creed would sell more albums in that time frame than U2, R.E.M., or The Smashing Pumpkins. In 1998 and 1999, the band would win Billboard magazine Rock Artist of the Year. Their single hire would spend a whopping 18 consecutive weeks at the number one spot on the mainstream rock charts. During the entire year and a half that the band toured behind Human Clay, frontman Scott Stapp had one rule. No new songs could be written. He would tell Rolling Stone, We wanted to live life and have experiences and set aside a time later where we would write. Upon returning home to Florida, Stapp and Tremonti didn't want to listen to any music to make their songwriting as pure as possible. With Stapp adding, we didn't want to be subconsciously influenced by anything. We wanted this record to completely come from what was in us. Within three weeks, Stapp and Tremonti had an album of new material that would become their third release, Weathered, a record that Stapp would call, according to Rolling Stone, the heaviest, most intense music we've ever written. 
Released in late 2001, Weathered proved to be another massive success, led in part by the lead single, My Sacrifice. The album went number one on the charts and sold over six million copies stateside. While the band had a lot to celebrate, cracks would soon form. Dealing with vocal issues, Stapp was prescribed an anti-inflammatory prednisone. To preserve his voice, Stapp sat out of sound checks, unlike previous tours. The sound checks had typically been a place where the band wrote and threw around new ideas. Without Stapp around, Tremonti was forced to throw around his song ideas with Phillips and touring bassist Brett Hesla, who would replace founding member Brian Marshall, who left or was fired from the band in 2000. It was also a difference of opinion over how the band's tour should go that created more tension between Tremonti and Stapp, as the guitarist wanted to be on the road for long periods of time while Stapp wanted to be on tour less. In addition to the internal tension, Stapp's behavior during the tour became increasingly erratic and unpredictable. Stapp struggled from alcohol abuse and drug addiction on the weather tour that was made worse by a car accident, resulting in him becoming heavily dependent on pain medication. It all came to a head during a late December concert in Rosemont, Illinois at the Allstate Arena in 2002. Following the show at the Allstate Arena, four fans filed a lawsuit against the band claiming Stapp was, and I quote, so intoxicated and or medicated that he was unable to sing the lyrics of a single Creed song. It was reported that during the same show, Stapp left the stage on several occasions during songs for long periods of time rolled around on the floor of the stage in apparent pain or distress and appeared to pass out while on stage during the performance. The plaintiffs in the case wanted a refund for all the 15,000 fans in attendance. The tickets cost $50 each, but the lawsuit estimates that with the service charges, parking, and other fees, the estimated 15,000 fans were owed around $2 million. Stapp would end up defending his performance, as he would leave a series of voicemails for the paper The Orlando Sentinel, claiming that he thought he gave a great, over-the-top performance. Stapp claimed that he was lying on stage because he was offering an over-the-top, dramatic performance meant to convey the difficulties he was facing in his personal life at the time. He claimed some fans mistook it as him passing out on stage. He would also go on to say that he was fighting an undisclosed illness at the time. Ultimately, the lawsuit got thrown out of court in late 2003. The ruling judge would claim that at a concert, there's no contract between artists and ticket holders and fans are not entitled to a good performance. The band soon got off the road and reconvened to try to write their next album, but its members were grasping at straws. Tremonti would tell MTV, we had gotten together two or three times and nothing happened. We got our instruments and played, but neither of us was taking it seriously. We were just running in circles. There wasn't a vibe like on the previous records. It felt very job-like. We knew that it would take us years to get a record out. Scott and I hadn't been close for a while and things just weren't working out. None of us really argued amongst each other. It was always Scott who had the problem. Stapp would give his side of the story, claiming he was suffering from depression at the time, telling Billboard magazine, I didn't know what was wrong with me and also I didn't want to let anybody down, so I just tried to keep it a secret, which is the biggest mistake anyone suffering from any type of mental health issue could make. It started with the depression for me, and then as a way to cope and try to feel better, try to literally do my job, I was self-medicating, which then led to, you know, the addiction and the other issues. In 2004, the band announced they were done. It was during their time apart, the members of Creed minus Stapp would team up with vocalist Miles Kennedy to form the group Alter Bridge, who would go on to have a good amount of success while Stapp would pursue a solo career. During his time outside of Creed, Stapp's alcohol abuse didn't let up, as he was arrested during a brawl with the members of the band 311 on Thanksgiving Day in 2005. We've covered that feud in a separate video. Link is down below. In addition to that, reports of a sex tape involving Stapp and Kid Rock shocked his religious fans. Stapp's solo album 2005's The Great Divide didn't fare much better. Perhaps it was due to Scott's behavior and image problem. The LA Times would also interview a DJ from WNORFM in Norfolk, Virginia, a station that embraced Creed, saying, as time went on, everything this guy did on stage exuded ego and people got sick of it, even the true fans. When they came to town, we would get the calls after the show, the complaints, but we will give this some consideration. In 2009, Creed would surprisingly reunite. Tremonti would talk about the reunion, revealing how he was planning on recording another Alter Bridge record, before finding himself in a room with Stapp, 
revealing, it seems as though over the last six years, he'd, referring to Stapp, done a lot of maturing and reflecting. He has his head on straight, and he realizes how truly important Creed was to him. Not just a monetary enterprise, but as a band, a group of people. Creed was an important thing for him to be a part of. Right there in our first meeting, he made us realize that we felt the same way. By late 2009, Creed would release their fourth album, Full Circle, which peaked at number two on the Billboard charts. The band would fight against high ticket prices during the tour, offering $10 and $20 tickets while also waiving fees on the first several thousand tickets sold. Despite these moves, the band wasn't able to sell out some of their gigs. Billboard magazine would write about the band's reunion tour, and I quote, The tour, the band's first in seven years, and ticket sales have ranged from mixed to a disaster. Even Creed's manager, Paul Greary of AGP Management, told the publication on the reunion tour, We frankly came up to some pretty erratic sales, a real mixed bag. We sold way more tickets right out of the box in some markets, and in other markets it was like, whoa, what went wrong here? By 2013, the band would go on hiatus again. Once again, it seemed like things between Stapp and Tremonti had soured. Tremonti told Krang Magazine in 2015 that Alter Bridge came between him and Stapp, with him recalling, when you single-handedly bring a band to its knees like he had done and we all split up, and then you build something, you're not all of a sudden going to just jump back to the other band and forget what you built. So I think he expected us to do that, especially me. Tremonti added, I think he took all his frustrations out on me. I think it all came down to one time when we were having lunch and catering. He was like, hey man, what are you doing in January? And I'm like, I'm going to the studio with Alter Bridge. We've talked about this. He's like, really? From then on, we didn't speak. On tour, on stage, didn't speak. But Stapp had his own version of events. Telling Jesus Freak Hideout, Mark had basically said to me, if you don't use the producer that I want to use, I'm not making a record with you. If you don't perform on stage the way I want you to perform, I don't want to do anything with you. If you don't use Alter Bridge's manager and business manager, I don't want to work with you. And if you don't change the way we've structured the royalties and the finances on the song that you wrote and I wrote, Scott, I'm not going to work with you. And basically he said, if you just don't do everything 100% my way, then he doesn't want to do it at all. It was following Creed's second break that Stapp went through some mental health issues and suffered psychotic episodes posting a series of disturbing videos on social media, claiming he was broke and living in a motel. It would come out shortly after that that Stapp was diagnosed as suffering from bipolar disorder. A few years later, it seemed like Stapp was doing better with the help of his family and friends. As to whether we'd ever see a Creed reunion, in 2019, Tremonti revealed the band had assembled enough song ideas that they had an album worth of material ready to go. Tremonti would tell the Jeremy Justa podcast in 2019, I'm sitting on an entire Creed album. When we were together doing the reunion tour, we put a lot of music together and have like really sketchy little demos of probably 13 songs. I listened to them maybe a year ago and they're good songs. Then, as recently as this year, Tremonti was asked about our Creed reunion, to which he responded, You never know. It's just one of those things where whenever it comes up, either our camp or Creed singer Scott Stapp has something going on at the moment, so our stars have to align. In fact, right now, if a promoter said, Hey, we want to do a huge Creed tour, I'd have to bypass all the stuff we're working on at the moment. So we just have to wait till the time is right. That does it for today's video. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe.